Welcome to the NEPA Scene Podcast. This is episode 15. We're coming to you from the studi- the Stude at 258 Studios in Scranton. I'm Rich Howells. I'm the founder and editor of NEPA Scene. I'm Lauren Corralico. <laughs> nothing, nothing to add to that? I didn't actually come up with anything for this week. Yet. I'm sorry. Okay. Wait, wait, that's that's to, fine. Are you, are you I'm supposed Lauren... to do something unique every time? I do, usually. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> you, wanna, you want me to do me and then I'll do... That didn't sound right, but I'll say what I say, and then you say what you say. You want okay. to do that? Okay. I'm Mark Denebaum. I own 258, and I'm also standing in for Jimmy Reynolds because I have Jimmy working on a movie, and um, he can't be here tonight. So I'm forever grateful and thankful for him for doing that. And Lauren is... In a lot of pain. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, we don't care. Uh, I got a bad back today. That sucks. Lauren Sorry. threw her back out, throwing snow. Now, in case he, anyone wanted to no, know nobody, that. In case they, they needed that specific Sorry. detail. Yeah. If I sound uh, grumpy, that's why. So we're here with uh, the founder of the Scranton Fringe Festival, an actor and playwright, and uh, the uh, founder of the Electric Residence, co-founder of the Electric Residence, uh, Connor. Hi, hi, hi. <laughs> Connor O'Brien of Con- the famous Scranton O'Briens. Not that famous? Well, it depends on what division of the family. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. No, no. No, you're a good Irish. You're a good Irish. You're a good Irish boy. A good Irish boy. Oh, my yeah. God. Jesus, but, Mary. Oh, do you know if you do you think that's one? No. Okay, yeah. we're going to get back on yeah. tangent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, wow, thanks, we're guys. all ready. I'm genuinely happy to be here. We're happy to have you. Wonderful. It's been a lot. It's 15 weeks I've wanted this. <laughs> You've been dreaming of Conor O'Brien the whole He's time. He's just been gest- yeah, I can't, like, gesting I, I love, the thought of me. I, I, you know, I love, I love Conor O'Brien to a fault, so... Send me to hell, send me to heaven. Uh, no, I'm just going to say that's a, that's a major character flaw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that probably explains a lot of my... That says a lot about you. Yeah. <laughs> I love Conor O'Brien to a fault. Mm. 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 Okay. Mm. 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 All right, do you want to do, yeah, do, so do the recap? Re- just real quick, uh, we just have on the site going on, we have we have a, a bunch of, uh, of uh, show announcements uh, coming out uh, and stuff that, that uh, some came out today. The Kirby Center actually had a bunch of uh, show announcements today for their uh, Live from the Chandelier Lobby series. So uh, check out who those artists are. And Florida, Georgia line? No, sorry, okay. not this time. Bummer. I did see a video from them last night, so it's the first time I've ever actually seen them. Yeah. Ew. You know, yeah. I forget about them every week. And, and, I, and I remind you. bring you. them up again. Yes, I do. Just again and again. Yep. <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a great state line. <laughs> One you definitely want to name your band after. Yeah. When I, when I was going to school in Florida, they always said, um, I, I went to school in Orlando, and they said, the further north you go, the further south you get. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Florida Georgia line is probably apropos. That's good. Or maybe these guys really didn't think through the naming of their. What else band. is there, Rich? Well, we we also uh, I don't I don't know if you've noticed in the past couple of weeks too, but uh, get cryptic, who uh, are a great uh, arts collective in uh, in Wilkes Barre. Um, they uh, have a, they've been announcing shows at the other side in Wilkes Barre, mm-hmm. and uh, we actually get to announce those first. So that's pretty cool. That's cool. Uh, that they let us do that. So we actually, we have, uh, uh, unrelated, but, but related, we have, uh, photos and a write up from a uh, recent show at the other side, uh, by Matt Hannon of, uh, five, seven, no photography, mm-hmm. who I, I think, uh, Connor, you're, you're aware of them. I am uh, aware of them. He, he had a, uh, a show back at the vintage, I think a few yeah, years ago. I mean, I mean, Teresa O'Connor was the visual arts director, so she was the curator and handled that, but I do remember it. It was very large. Yeah. P- <laughs> photography. He has, he has some good kind stuff. Kind of like I stood outside, uh, <laughs> no, I remember the work. Yeah, just I just, I just, you know, I don't directly. Nobody deal with forgets it. large photography. It was large. I want to say that it was printed on a very specific. Was it like really like thin? Was it canvas? Maybe no. There was something unique about the presentation of it. Mm. Um, and I feel so ignorant for not knowing. But it was something. I did definitely. Was it like tin? It was like metal. Or well, it was like the the last ones that he uh, sent to us um, that we we posted a, a few weeks back uh, were were really psychedelic and and very colored really cool so mm-hmm. uh, so I'm interested to see uh, what what these photos look like uh, cool. they'll, they'll be I'll probably post those uh, tomorrow um, we also have uh, I just did my uh, infinite improbability this week on, which I read uh, today I the Mars one mission do you agree or disagree lauren i was so ready well, wait do you want to do you want to just do a recap of basically what okay. it is like the sure the, the 10 second yeah 
Uh, the 10-second explanation would be that uh, Mars One is a Dutch nonprofit organization who has decided that they're going to shoot 40 people to Mars and that they're somehow going to survive even though the science is really, really bad. And many experts and scientists have come out and said that it's they might, even if they make it, would probably last about 68 days before suffocating and dying. And mind you, they're going to fund this through crowdfunding and the television rights. So we're going to watch 40 people suffocate and die on Mars. I just love the Hunger Games-esque me too to it i i that's and that's what struck me about it as a sci-fi guy mm-hmm. like i had to write about it because it was like this is the plot out of a of, of a sci-fi movie but like the opposite like they want to go right are, now, that's the and that's really what the focus of the article yeah, it's is like, it's is like that katniss just, going like why are we having a drawing i'm going like I, right. it's yeah. not volunteering his tribute to save you know primrose or whatever her name was like no <laughs> I want to fight. You almost have to have the drawing to p- get people to not participate. Right. Well, I, I think it's so fascinating. And I, Rich, I'm not going to lie. I didn't read the article. But with those individuals, I mean, they are like cutthroat. Like, no, I want to leave. Let's say it even succeeded. They can never come back. Right. Like, that's the whole Correct. point. Like, they, can no. Ne- no. they can't come back. Nope. Right. They, right. Right. There's that, no return. Mission. Right. That's what I'm saying. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. They, like you are literally like. I would love to do an expose on those people's lives of like, what happened? They no, want to leave Earth so badly. Those people, the people that were, what's the 200 right now? Out of like 10,000? It's uh, to, down to 100 now. So it's out, down out to 100 two, now. 200,000 people sent in applications. What and the, now it's down to 100. What are, the, what are the qualifications? Some of them are like astrophysicists and some of them are... One of them you know, got and, a postgraduate doctoral whatever in yeah they're not astrophysics. Like, from so MIT. we want to lose these people. Well, okay. right. they want to leave. It's not that we're losing them. They want to leave. I was before I read Infinite Improbabilities. I was of the mind that this is a spectacular event, one of the first things in our lifetime that is actually going to pave the way towards space exploration, and no matter the cost, however ridiculous it sounded, this is extraordinary. The thing that's happening. Then I read your article and I said, wow, this is kind of a messed up situation. <laughs> yeah. However, coming, bringing it back to every other colonization in humankind, the first people to ever go to a new land always went presuming they were never going to come back. They didn't mm-hmm. know what they were going to find. They didn't know if they were going to go somewhere that they could survive. They didn't know what they were bringing was going to be enough. It's happened right. throughout right. history. The first, the Vikings then went over to Let's say America. They didn't know what they were going to find. They just set sail and kept going. Right. Right. With no hope of possibly getting back. They had air. Yeah, well, that's the thing is the the only big difference here I feel from those because I, I I do Valid feel point. it, it is a, is a good example. And many many died, and many knew right. they were going Valid. to. And die they knew they were the going journey. to die. Yes. Yeah, but there was but, berries. They at least had but berries. But in the old days they didn't have the kind of technology that we have today to like put a robot out there first and see what happens to the robot before we send living people to go suffocate and die in horrible deaths that we know right pretty much for a fact are going to happen which they know the candidates know too well that's yeah. the that's the thing and so so i first question well how stable are these people that they're they, they're saying oh yeah let my head explode that's totally cool i think well it's not going to be total recall <laughs> yeah well <laughs> But, you know, well, well, I, I really hope it is. But the other oh, thing is just just I feel like um, is even the, the robots that they're going to send first to build the encampment. Mm-hmm. Now, robots are going to build the encampment. That right. in itself is extraordinary and things that I didn't know existed until I realized they don't actually exist yet. That technology is still being worked out <laughs> and they hope is going to be ready by the time they re- they're ready to launch living in people like the there. the next eight years. Isn't it like they're trying to do all this? They're trying to do this years. by it's, 2026. It's really important to set benchmarks for yourself but you're not nasa's not going until 2030 poor but poor nasa doesn't have the funding to do this you know what my concern is here's my biggest concern on the whole thing is that when we get there we don't treat the martians like native americans you know that's going to happen. Depends. You know what I mean? We could be we could be it's dying. Any Izzard thing like, do you have a flag? Yeah. Well, we we could be dying with our last breath, and we would have our hands around the Martians' necks, going, yeah. "Give me this piece of red rock." You know, <laughs> like it, it, that's just it's Rich, humanity. I, I didn't read the article, but just to sum it up, is there? Did they? Did did you find? Or is there any percentage of like success? Like, what are the odds? Literally. Zero. 
There's they're, no they're chance. Going, they're going they're, to die. They, all, all the scientists that, that I found that commented that I quoted in the article mm-hmm. um, are, Rich, are Rich basically like, research. like we, we love this idea. We think it's really good. It's just that it's not quite there yet. So like okay. it's remotely probable, but probably But not. if the launch isn't happening until 2026, then... And They're hoping that things will be worked out by them, but right. they also most of them also estimate that at this point in the game, you probably should have a good portion of your money together, and they have raised about seven hundred thousand bucks out of, out of six, six billion. billion. Yeah. That is the most expensive suicide I've ever heard of. And, and not to mention that the six billion most scientists don't even think that's enough. They're I'm like, here to talk. It's, it's probably going to cost way more than that. My. By the time 20- there's uh, using your uh, <laughs> by the, using, yeah exactly inflation using, using Lauren's concept of of like you know most explorers you know do go out without you know expecting a way back you know it, it was 1960 or 61 that Kennedy said by the end of this decade by the we end of this decade we will go we will put a man on the moon right like you know these guys actually have a longer time frame. And right now than Kennedy gave the space program to do it specifically talking to your point Russia sent out. Numerous cosmonauts for the exploration of outer if, of inner space without any hope of bringing them back. Yeah, that's Russia, though. Yeah, ru- well, I mean, <laughs> Russia's just like, oh, poor Sergey, he's just a number, right? <laughs> and the, yeah. the only people who knew were two guys in New Jersey because they picked it up on their ham radio or yeah. something, right? Yep. Yeah, mm. they and they never came back, did they? No, they never came back. Yeah, and that's just that just came out. Did I read an article about that last week? Kind, mm. kind of like a couple of years ago, but Yeah, but it's it it, it somehow it got brought back into the public I'm, consciousness. I'm sure people are because, probably talking about it now because of this. Yeah. Right. As none of us are astrophysicists or have, <laughs> or have any concept of no. I, I shouldn't say that. I'm awful at math, so I, I would not be the person to... Right. What's your question, Connor? Important charge. Two what, plus two equals dance What number. else did you have to say, Rich? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, that, that's, I do want to read that article, though. That sounds interesting. I just yeah, wanna, no, it was fun. It's really I just want to point out that considering every other motivation for colonization of other lands has been, in, throughout human history, has been stemmed in some sort of thing going on in those coloni- colonists' homeland, Right. right? And there are a lot of motivations now to actually go out and explore other terrains where we could possibly survive. Mm-hmm. So it's not I'm not saying that we have the technology to do this now. And I and I do agree that it's a little bit premature to be saying, hey, let's send out people so they could colonize for 68 days and then croak. So we but can send another what, team of people to why not have take up where they let. But why not start the process is actually getting us. A little bit closer to that point where we might be able to get to Europa. Even if they're right. not the ones to accomplish it, at least it's getting right. the dialogue rolling. We have to, well, not we only have that, to the, pave that road. Not only that, like the, people, the people, like the fact that we're having a conversation about it right now means that I'm hoping that there's other people around the world having the same conversation going like, hey, guys, like I looked at your schematics, you know, right. I, I didn't know about this, but this is like, maybe you can fix this. To to just to show how f- much foresight can happen, this is something really interesting. Um, I'm a huge Jules Verne fan, the novel. Oh, I thought you were going to say I'm a huge Jewel fan. Well, why can't you be both? I don't know. Um, no, I'm a huge One explores Jules- the world, one explores your heart. <laughs> Jules Verne explores my heart. Um, <laughs> no, um, Jules Verne wrote a book called From the Earth to the Moon and Back, which I'm actually in process of adapting into a play, um, very loosely inspired. Um, I love Jules Verne. He proposed it was like in a giant cannonball, of these like three people that shot off and like roped around the moon's gravitational pull and came back. He proposed within the book his own mathematical equations and uh, suggestions on how to make it happen. And obviously he was incorrect. S- very not even very close, but just closer than a man of his time period and should ever have gotten. I mean, he was really getting on to something. His math was off, but like you considering know, how precise you need that math to be. That's because he's a time traveler. Because he's a time lord. And he was just a little, and he did, he wanted us to know that he was good, but he wanted us to know how good. Um, but no, but I think that's really interesting just to show you that, you know, the, you know, a fictional, you know, fantasy novel that was, but the other reason I speak of that is because in the book, the co- the country it's kind of like a steampunky post civil war um society which is controlled by the gun companies and i just thought that's really interesting <laughs> all right so the society is controlled by the gun companies and their idea was let's put three people in a big gun B- big cannonball and literally <laughs> poof, to the moon from the earth to the moon and back it's it's just so charming and it's so you know jules verne ish cuz he wrote it so it's, so it better be Jules Verne. So yeah, it's not you know, it's not Hemingway. 
<laughs> it's it sounds super interesting though. It's, I, I would totally watch that. It's really thank you. It's really interesting. It's really interesting. There's like a French poet they send up with them who I think would be so French he could not even stand it. Come sit come, come sit next come sit next yeah. to how you say me? Yeah, Jean Pierre. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly how you say me. <laughs> It's loosely inspired, and it's in the public domain, so anyone can deal with it. Oh, that's amazing! All right, so after oh, Mars it, One, I'll, I'll just I'll mention one other thing, and uh, and then we'll we'll move on. But uh, uh, this was just announced today, and I thought this was interesting. Uh, we we've brought up a peculiar culinary company before. I love and, Gene and mm-hmm. the food that they do. It's amazing. Uh, you know, he's been getting some national attention because of the TV shows he's been on. Thoroughly deserved. Very deserved. Uh, and he is going to be doing a Pulp Fiction themed dinner. I need to go to that. Where when, where you where? You what? watch Pulp Fiction and then you're eating the food that th- is inspired by the, the film. Where, when, how much? <laughs> this will be at uh, Movies 14 in Wilkes-Barre. It is uh, March 2nd. Oh, no. It is a Monday. It's a Monday night. I'm yep. teaching. Uh, the dinner starts at seven movie at seven 30. Um, but yeah, it should be, should be very interesting. So and no I, one else go. Oh, Cause wait, I can't. Wait, right. wait a minute. What time on it's a Monday and what time? Uh, seven, seven and seven 30. Can, can, can we talk about this later, Mark? Yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. Totally. But that sounds, if you, whether or not we can go, who cares? Everyone else should go to that. Cause that sounds awesome. Right. Not only is he a damn good cook, he's a damn good guy. Yes, that's and very true. And, and that's, he's a big fan of metal. Which, oh, yeah, okay. yeah, actually, uh, I, I, I saw him uh, at the uh, Crowbot show a while ago, a few months back, and I was like, is that Gene? I didn't know he was a, he was a metal guy. Crowbot. Huge metal fan. Yeah, it's awesome. So, oh, and uh, I guess I should plug that we have our show, our showcase coming up on uh, Friday on the 27th. At the Woodlands. At the Woodlands uh, for our YouTube uh, viewers. Here's the uh, really nice poster that we had printed up. And uh, we're going to have poets, comedians, musicians, uh, all kinds of uh, performance artists at this uh, really cool event. It's the first time that we're trying something like this. Uh, So it'll be interesting to see if it is successful or not. If people want these types of events in the area, we'll definitely do more. So we're hoping to, uh, to convince people to come out and check out uh, what is you know largely new talent to most of the area? I don't think a lot of like a lot of these guys are have done some really great shows, but I don't know if they've had the mainstream exposure. So I'd like to see uh, some of these these uh, people get out there and and uh, for people to support them. So I, I think it's going to be a, a cool show. It's only ten bucks if you get the tickets in advance, which they're available on NEPAScene.com right now. Um, and you can go to nepacene.eventbrite.com and just buy the tickets directly if you use uh, the promo code uh, Rich because all of our uh, all you of our people egomaniac. No, actually, that was chosen by John. I'm just kidding. Who's our our co organizer? He uh, he he said anybody who uh, it will everybody who has their names can uh, use the uh, their name as the promo code and then, then we'll know who sold tickets and who was a lazy asshole now I'm kidding but uh, so 10 bucks uh, 15 at the door which includes your first drink by the way so there's a food and cash bar as well um, it'll be a couple hour show and uh, we'll have at least 10 performers so uh, sounds like great. a fun time it is well worth the time and money absolutely Agreed. here here so uh, so Connor how are you I'm doing okay Rich how are you Great, great. Are you uh, now the the Scranton Fringe Fest is yes. you know still quite a few months away. So are are you away. already like sweating bullets about putting this thing together? Or are you you still like I consciously think I'm fine. It's funny you say that. Last night I had a panic dream that it was three days before. Oh, and that, like, nothing was ready. <laughs> so I think that's just my mind's. Um, no, there's a lot to do to prepare for the Fringe Festival, but that, it's not until the first weekend of October, October 1st through the 4th, 2015 mm. in downtown Scranton. Um, no, not really. I mean, I, I mean, I probably should be, but um, I think that was a dream that was just manifested itself about the festival, but I'm 
stressing about other stuff totally unrelated. Well, the, the reason that we're having you on now is because uh, artist applications just opened up uh, mm-hmm. for the Fringe Festival. They did. So uh, any any uh, potential artists that are interested in being at this festival uh, yes. should definitely uh, check out the uh, Scranton Fringe Fest website, which mm-hmm. is... Uh, ScrantonFringe.org. Yes. And uh, so go, go there and apply. Correct. Because the, uh, I, I think uh, next month is with the cutoff. April 10th. Oh, okay. April you have, 10th. You have time. Okay. It's Feb- it opened February 9th. They close April 10th. Um, and just to give a really simple, and we can talk more if there's questions. I was going to ask. Okay. Um, what is a Fringe Festival? Yes. yes. Um, right, that's right. okay. That's okay. Um, to put it simply, it's a performing arts festival. That's the easiest way to put it. The reason it's called Fringe, in Edinburgh, Scotland, in 1947, there was this big international, which still goes on simultaneously with the Fringe, uh, anyway, theater festival that seven or eight companies couldn't get into, whether they were considered too avant-garde, too experimental, and quite frankly, just not known. Um, so they decided, they were like, well, screw that. We're going to start our own festival. And then they did it once, was somewhat popular, did it again the second year. And then a journalist, I believe his name was Robert Kemp, um, in Scott, in the Edinburgh Times or the Edinburgh Gazette, uh, forgive me, I should know my history of the fringe a little bit tighter. Um, and Scotland and Scotland, (laughs) um, the journalist coined, there's a lot of theater happening on the fringe. So its name kind of at the time had a bit of a double meaning of the literal location it was happening, but more so it was the on the outskirts of the mainstream, to steal a phrase that you re- you just used, Rich. Um, so that's why anything's welcome down the fringe. The first Fringe Festival in North America was held in Orlando in 1992. Um, they've, and then I think the, and then it was Canada and it's models vary from city to city structure varies, uh, you know, length of them, you know, what the makeup is very selection process, which is a big, you know, very Asian. The end of the day, they're typically, um, performing arts based, easy to participate in both as a patron and an artist. So low risk financially in that regard, they're generally low tech and rapid fire. That doesn't mean I've been seeing fringe shows that have, you know, projections and special effects. It generally just means that you have to be prepared to move quickly. And they're usually the length of them sits around an hour. Ours, for example, each performance. Correct. Because there's, and then you do your performance several times throughout the festival. Right. Um, Some festivals are juried, which is which, what the Scranton Fringe is. Um, we're, we are promoting it, though, as a limited jury, an inclusive limited juried process, which simply just means we're going to try to accept as many as we can, if not all, in a perfect world. Uh, but for example, we've had someone submit um, and apply with interest uh, who's part of a trapeze and aerial dance group. So that really, where we'd love to, it's just dependent upon if a venue can accommodate that. So we, I mean, and it has to be because for their safety. Um uh, and yeah, so we're not charging any application or production fees. Oh, and talking about models, some festivals like ours are juried. I said the Scranton Fringe is a limited jury process. Some are find your own venue model, um, which like Edinburgh. So pretty much like that's like you, within this footprint of whatever parameters, you know, locations you set in this time period, you have to find secure your own venue. And the Edinburgh Fringe, I mean, produces like a 30, 50 page guide every year of like how to do it and what venues they recommend. I mean, it's, it is, it is officially in Edinburgh, the world's largest performing arts festival. Um, the Guinness Book of World Records confirmed that Which a they get of people from ago. all over the world though, right? Oh, I mean, going to the Edinburgh Fringe has become a big deal. I mean, like, you know, you can show up and perform in a phone booth if you want, and then you get put in the booklet and the map and stuff. Um, and you have to pay to do that. Um, but I mean, no, there are people who are like, you know, selling out New York clubs and stuff, you know, like performer artists, cabaret artists, stuff like that, stand up comedians, you know, theater plays, you know, things that are a little more off the mainstream. But there's also things like, um, does anyone know that I believe her name is Christine Bianco? She's a very, she's really popular on YouTube now. She's been on Ellen a couple of times. She's the singer who sings any given song and she, she changes who she sounds like throughout it. When let it, I know I, I saw a cover she did of this Frozen song "Let It Go." Where she sounded like Adina Menzel, then she sounded like Celine Dion, and then she sounded like Kelly Clarkson and Alanis Morissette. It was so funny. She's just so talented. This isn't about her. Um, Are you sure? I will talk about her all you want. <laughs> we can tag her in this now at least. Um, well, how did um? Oh shit! In hell, I forgot my question. Okay, keep going. Um, so that kind we of, we don't even need to ask you questions. Just go. No, I'm fine. Yeah. Um, I just want to get, I know I'm, 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 wanna, I'm ranting a bit cause I want to get as much info out there as possible. And then, then we can have an open dialogue. Um, <laughs> so it's October 1st through the 4th. So downtown the O'Brien podcast premiered today, multiple venues <laughs> and the world quivered. Um, 
so yeah, multiple venues, anything within the performing arts, music, theater, storytelling, 40 to 70 minutes in length is the range that we're going to be presenting. All tickets are priced at seven to $10, um, seven if you have a fringe button, 10 if you don't. Uh, there's also going to be like hopper passes that you can buy or like multiple ticket show deals to save extra money. Um, and it's going to be a really, really great time. Vent several venues in downtown Scranton over those four day time period. Um, and do you have, do you have confirmed venues yet? Or do you not want to release that yet? No, no, we can talk about it. Um, I'm going to say these are confirmed in the strictest sense of the word without actually legally being confirmed. <laughs> um, no, we have we have letters of commitment and intent from the Atha Gallery on Lackawanna Avenue, uh, the Leonard on Adams, uh, Ale Mary's on Franklin, and the Lackawanna County Children's Library on Vine. So those are the four I can say with pretty good certainty. So anybody else who wants to be a venue can just go check out. They can contact us. We have a lot of penciled in options out there. That's why I say that tentatively. There's been so many wonderful venues. We wish we could work with all of them. We quite frankly aren't just going to need that much more. Do you think we could fit a trapeze in the other room? I'm not insured for that. What are you, crazy? <laughs> 25 eights also on the short list, obviously, but that all, that's all dependent upon your availability and, you know, if we... My fear of trapeze artists. Yeah, that too. Have yeah. you ever done trapeze? No, n- no. I don't like... Somebody once said that this I'm afraid summer. of anything higher than a bar stool. <laughs> so, I'm going to take you this summer. It's a lot of fun. Not going. What was the impetus for this? Why? Do the Scranton Fringe Festival? Yeah. Um... I oh um my main inspiration came from the fact I participated in a few of my own work. Um I was in the the, the first ever Pittsburgh Fringe back in May of 2014. Oh, is that where you did the Darling Core? That's where the Darling Core first yeah, premiered yeah. and developed. Um and then which was a blast. And then uh, a, a show I that I co-wrote with Simone Daniel, a show I wrote myself called Prophecy of the Teen Sleuth that Simone directed. Uh, we went out and did in Kansas City, Missouri. So it was really interesting to see first of all you know, the Northeast and the Midwest, but Pittsburgh, that was their first fringe festival in Kansas city. That was their 10th. Mm. So it was, I mean, much more developed. Pittsburgh was great. Pittsburgh is an awesome city. They have a great arts theater, performing arts scene. If they were so accommodating to us, it was so sweet. And if it wasn't for them, Simone and I would not be taking the darling core in the directions we are now, which I'm very excited about on a personal level. Um, we can talk about that later if we want. We'll totally talk about it later. Cause I want to, um, <laughs> but yeah, so that's kind of just a very, general n- overview of uh, what the Fringe Festival is and what we hope it to be. And we've already been getting submissions. The submissions opened April 9th, uh, f- excuse me, February 9th, February 9th. They close April 10th. And um, to date, we have gotten 28 submissions. Well, that's great. I mean, mm-hmm. that's and that's pretty soon. So, I mean, that to consider, uh, you know, just a few weeks have gone by. I know. And the interesting part about it is 40% are from out of the region. Oh, wow. In, in fact, we rain, we have submissions from, and we, we can't obviously talk about, I can tell you the general what they are. Yeah. If we haven't accepted them, I don't want to. I don't want them to. You know, but submissions from as far as Pittsburgh, uh, Rochester, New York. The farthest within the country is Dallas. Are we only have one international submission so far, and it is the farthest overall. A uh, little bit of Montpellier, uh, Paris, France. Paris, France. Wow, are those the trapeze artists? They're not. <laughs> they're not. They're the. They're the puppet people. They they they, they, they come out of the. <laughs> <laughs> they just they, they just like to come and look at you and tell you how much they cannot even stand you. Um, <laughs> I fought in your general dead back. <laughs> I, I owe you nothing. I did nothing for you. Um, <laughs> no, I am highly respectful of the French culture, as you can tell. Um, no, but Jimmy loves them because of the croissant. Croissant. Yeah, Jimmy will get. I don't think Jimmy's ever had a real croissant, but he 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 he, he, he insists that Dunkin' Donuts has the best one. That's Dunk- that is no. such a lie. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm the, just saying. The best croissant I ever had was in Ocean City, Maryland, hmm. at this little place that called she found the Satellite in a garbage Cafe. bin. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's interesting. I think mine was probably like New York or Chicago or Boston or something. If you can't remember your best croissant. It was not the best croissant. I'm not saying it's the best in the world. I'm just saying for my that life. That you've had. That I've had. Yeah. Because um, if anybody says it's the best in the world, then it's that speculation and conjecture. Exactly. Um, but yeah. So that's just to show you where we stand right now. So anyone, um, one of the, I mean, it's always an educational process. That was the number one thing I found with talking with Pittsburgh, Kansas City, the two in New York. Every fringe festival. I belong to a, a network group where I can stay in daily contact with managers and directors of other fringe festivals in the country, the world, actually. Um, I've developed a very good contact in Stockholm 
believe it or not. <laughs> Hope um, you don't catch a syndrome. Uh, I'd love to. I'd love to. Um, <laughs> no Stockholm syndrome. I'd lo- I honest to God was considering going, but it's like two weeks after ours and there's no humanly possible way I'll have the time. Um, or money by that matter. Uh, maybe, maybe I, by then I can save up a little bit. Um, but the number one thing I asked them, like, what's the biggest thing that you would recommend to me? Like, what didn't you know going into this? And it varies from city to city. The common thread, you will never stop. It's kind of a blessing and a curse. Like, don't stress about it, but be aware you will never stop educating your public on what you are. It'll never become common knowledge. It'll never become... I mean, they said unless you're in, you know, like Edinburgh, and even then, there's probably someone who doesn't. There's probably like that one dude, yeah, down at the bus station. Um, Stieg. Ugh, Stieg. <laughs> nobody Stieg cares. Nobody is cares. At the pub going. Stieg doesn't care about what you have to say. Um, What's this fringe? What's the, the rubber paper poop man over in the fringe <laughs> festival? What is he doing over there? That doesn't even make sense. I'm going back to my Guinness. <laughs> we actually we just had Connor on the show just so that we could do fake accents the entire time. And I could That's just the only f- reason disgustingly offend. I showed I showed Jim Seth MacFarlane did this uh, cartoon cavalcade. The Scottish, yeah, where he's like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> well, uh, I showed Jimmy it for the first time, and when Jimmy heard "poop it." <laughs> He's just a pulpit. And Jimmy was like, oh my God, that's amazing. I think those are just pretty much understood to be like Seth's, like the ones that didn't make it into the show. Yeah. He's put, which are some of the most funny though. That are oh, they're hysterical. They're great. They're great. Um, but yeah, so that was the number one thing they said clear. You're always going to be educating your public on what fringe festivals are. Um, I mean, so you're going to spend the next like six months constantly explaining. Constantly. So you yeah. you have the spiel down at this point. I constantly have to work on it, though. It's not an elevator pitch yet. I mean, the elevator pitch would be like, you know, it's a performing arts festival that's inclusive to all mediums and styles. Anyone's welcome. And it's kept affordable for artists and patron alike. Like, that's the closest thing to an elevator pitch. I can and then people mean. are like, what does that mean? And what did you just say? <laughs> Got a pretty little mouth. What's performance? <laughs> I don't know why we just went deliverance there. Um, because why not? Because why Wee! not? Wee! <laughs> Every time I hear those Geico commercials or whatever, with the- <gasps> don't eat. Oh, I no. just ruined it for you, didn't I? I love that. Just pig. ruined it for you. I love that pig. I love the Wee! Yeah. Billy. What? Yeah, you're here. Oh, okay, thanks. now, 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 get this ready. Yeah, Ned Beatty. Now you're screwed. Because when you when you look at that, you think Ned Beatty. Why did, why did you do this, Mark? That was an awful thing to do. Because huh? I'm just, I don't know. Mr. Oh, Rogers God. would be very disappointed I in you. I feel, I feel like, I feel like uh, Ed Norton and Fight Club. I wanted, oh. I wanted to destroy something beautiful. I need his back. Thoughts back. What I was trying to clarify about with the submission process and where we're getting them from and everything, and that one of the areas that I am educating the public, is specifically the arts community, there's been some confusion, not much, but a little confusion over like, oh, so I submit my show and then you guys produce it. No. No, 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 no. The Fringe provides, this is, you know, just what, you know, what the artist responsibility. The opportunity. The Fringe provides the platform. We'll provide the box office staff. We will assist with marketing for the overall festival. We will uh, provide one tech operator per venue. We're even going to help provide private housing. Um, it's our goal, at least, for any out-of-town artists. And we'll help as best we can. You pr- bring your product, your finished product show. Right. We are, we're not a script hatchery. We're not a development. We're not a production company. And that's, and that's an understandable confusion if you're not familiar but even most theater performing arts festivals, like, you know, you don't, a band doesn't submit to a music festival and then shows up and says, you know, oh, we need a bassist. It's, you know, that's, that's your, I'm just saying, I understand that Sometimes seems Sometimes they do. I understand that seems ridiculous, <laughs> but it's the closest connotation I can give. So that's something. And it doesn't mean that you have to have like, this could be something you're trying for the first time. That's fine. It just, you have to produce your show and you have to help market your own individual show. We are looking at a festival that might have anywhere between 30 to 50 you know, proximate individual shows. So we have to promote that whole thing on top of making sure it runs smoothly and the logistics and the finances and stuff. There's no production fee. There's no application fees. And the the gross box office split with each show is done 50, 50. So there is no reason (laughs) to not. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, I mean, I mean, financially that they, it would benefit Benefit them. them. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, that's, and that was kind of like the conversation we had with like, you know, when T and Vinny were on, it's like, you know, the more people you guys get to the door, the more money you make. Like, I don't understand right. why that's such a and we'll provide a pl- difficult concept. And we'll provide the platforms. I mean, I, I as an artist, I understand what it's like when, you know, the house, shall we say, doesn't help promote and doesn't market. But we're marketing the overall festival. And we will, in turn, develop programs and, and platforms such as working with NEPA scene to give them the opportunity. Like, we're going to give them all a little press kit or, you know, at least like a press kit for local press we're going to give them some suggestions we're going to conduct workshops on how to 
Obviously, that'll be difficult if you're not from the area and can't attend, but we'll try to make sure that we have PDFs and digital video form of whatever that we do. Um, so it's a real, you know, to you know, for all those educational outreach components, we can only do so much. You know, you have to, have to, have to, have to, have to. No, I've been to I've been to film festivals where where you know, let's say you know, S- Steven did a you know a twenty minute short film. Mm-hmm. Oh, Steven, Steve, Steve, oh, Steve. unbelievable. Um, Steve I've been I've been to film awful. festivals where Bill Danger Robinson <laughs> was showing his sci fi short, and oh, we'll get to him. Um, but they all had like every every film had their own like somebody's out there passing out postcards like pass out postcards the times go that to the lines movie's playing when where it's playing at. when another movie is line is you know yeah. queue is lining up go pass out postcards yep. we're giving you at, at the very least the one thing that every artist should, who's in the who gets accepted to the fringe take advantage of is October first the Thursday nights because it's Thursday Friday Saturday Sunday the only fringe event happening other than maybe some like late night after party stuff you know it's Scranton all, it has to happen with all the fun kids yeah. um is the preview party which is likely going to be at the leonard it's going to be one location it's you know some free food cash bar come in costume come in character pass out your postcards have people there and then in addition to it being a big party which you can mix and mingle with the crowd it's totally free to attend then there will also be every show will be given like two to five minutes depending on what we can give them as a soapbox on stage like you have two to three minutes go I don't care if you you could stand at the mic and just talk about your show. Right. Or you could do a sample of it or whatever. I mean, and that's fine. That is probably going to be like 30 to percent of where your marketing should happen. Is that that preview show? Just because, I mean, people with hopper passes who yeah. can go to anything, you know, our VIPs, members of the media, you know what I mean? Like, you know, anyone, the public, you know, I'm going to show up and go, yeah, I'm going to one or two shows. Maybe I'll check some, something else. When we were in Kansas City, that's, I mean, like we just got there like the day before, I think, or maybe even the day we might have even gotten, we might have even pulled into town. And now that I think about it like that afternoon and the preview night was that night. Um, and we were thankful they placed us all our shows for like five, four or five days was like in the first part of the festival because it was like 11 days long. Oh, so we didn't. So thankfully we could go do it and come back. We didn't get to stay for the whole duration of the festival, but for like the first half. Um, and we had I, I ne- I've never really sat down and done the math and I'd have to go, you know, figure it out. But like never we had less. And we were in a great theater, like a 200 seat theater, you know, modern. It was in this gorgeous um, it's called Union Station in Kansas. If you ever go to Kansas City, Missouri, Union Station, it's gorgeous. It's a big, big, big old train station that's now has like restaurants i mean it's so scratched to a page from what this thing did um museum uh you know little kiosks and stuff we probably had like close to 150 200 people see our show throughout oh, the festival that's awesome i mm, maybe that's i don't know because i'm trying we never had less i remember looking out in a crowd we never had less than like 30 people in our sh- in our crowd so i can't imagine and i mean mind you we're from scranton pa we weren't the farthest there was obviously international and but we were you know pretty far yeah, but for not being hometown and, you know, and having literally the only market and there's things we could have done a little bit more in advance, but the only marketing we really had was getting there that day and having like little flyers and stuff and passing them out. Now, with, with the application process, has there been any confusion as to what kind of performance art? Because if it's if it's open to everybody, I mean, you know, our bands just going to go, well, can I just have a you know show with bands? Yeah, no, that has, that has happened. Okay. But that's not necessarily I see it's we're, we always struggled with how do we word this? We don't want to. We kind of came to the conclusion we're not going to turn anyone away. We're going to make this as general as possible. Worst case scenario, we get 200 submissions and a couple we have to contact and say, this isn't really what we're looking for, or this isn't really. But for our late night on the fringe component, so like, you know, the 12 a.m. to 2 a.m. at the bars and stuff like that, the Keys and the Bog or even Ale Mary's, if it doubles, we are going to have bands. So it's not like we don't need those people. So, you know, even if you and then we've had like a, a visual artist or two submit and the visual arts will be represented in different ways. That's not really what we're looking for right now. We're going to focus on that later. Um, but. I would rather, I, I don't want to, it's always better to start the dialogue than, than, than postpone it. The worst thing is, oh my God, thank you so much for submitting. This isn't quite what we're looking for right now, but we will contact you when we are. And honestly, by the time that at these applications end, when we really get around to, you know, selecting them and, and putting them in there, you know, figuring everything out, that'll probably be when we're working on the other stuff anyway. Because the whole schedule, everything's going to get announced at the same time. Um, we're printing the Fringe Guide, which is like a multi-page, color, really nice program. That, that'll that start getting printed in like mid-late July. And that'll start getting distributed everywhere. So, I mean, we need the full lineup by then to promote and announce. We should be announcing the main stage lineup by like May, I would say. 
Sounds like a lot of work. Now, who do you have working with you on this? Oh my goodness, so many people. Uh, um, <laughs> I feel so terrible. Stieg from Steeg. Scotland. Stieg. Stieg. And Stieg is Steve. And Steve. Look at all the colorful people. Um, we have so there's so many people. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna say it right now. I will forget someone. Here's your Oscar sure. speech. I will forget. Yeah. Oh my god. Right? I want to thank. I want to thank Julianne Moore's children. Um, <laughs> You know, speaking of which, were you uh, were you watching the Oscars last night? I didn't, but ooh, don't get me started. Don't get me started. <laughs> um, Casey Thomas, uh, Lori Lockney, um, oh my goodness, uh, Lenny Constance, Mandy Boyle, um, my goodness, Sam Nardelli. Um, the, I mean, the, the executive committee, shall we say, is still kind of forming. Um, Jen Patica. Um, my goodness. The, I mean, like there, you know, Chantel. I mean, we've had, you know, we've had some Elizabeth Bohan. Oh my God, Elizabeth's like the second in command. I that, that would have sucked if I forgot. <laughs> um, I just, I'm, I'm so scatterbrained right now. Um, there's a, there's a lot of people that are kind of on board. The roles of what people need to do. We're really being particular of making sure we're not, you know, robbing, you know, Peter to pay Paul in that system. Um, there's people that are like, I can do this and I can be involved. Doesn't mean they have to be sitting at the executive table, which is just the fancy word for the people that have to do the the dirty work, the the yeah. not fun work. Um, but yeah, no, we're really excited. We're going to still keep holding volunteer meetings. We need lots of different volunteers. We need tech operators. We need venue managers to handle to be the liaisons between the fringe, the venues and the artists. We need, uh, you know, box office. We need, you know, as many people want to help with marketing. Um, we are looking for interns. I just attended the Marywood University internship fair that went quite well. Um, but yeah, no. So there's, it's, it's, it's a massive community effort that's making this happen. There's people like you guys that are helping get the word out there and helping spread and, um, you know, encapsulating all that is Scranton. Uh, I met with, I met with the NEPA visitor spirit. There's so many agencies and nonprofits and businesses, Lamar advertising, Garrity supermarkets, who's going to be selling all of our buttons and their branches come summer. Um, they're all, uh, Lamar advertising not only has made a fiscal donation, but it's also, uh, going to be donating digital billboards whenever we need them. Um, I mean, we really have so many, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. So I'm going to stop because if I don't, if I, as long as I don't list a thousand instead of not listing one, well, we're going to have you clip. back on when it comes. Oh, to yeah, Tay. Sure. Oh, Tay. You don't have to, you know, and some trapeze artists who will just be, know. who will be here doing flips and It's going to be amazing. Be not, awesome. only, not only am I afraid of heights, I'm afraid of people next to heights. <laughs> I'm about, one of those what guys. What about ribbon dancers? I, that's no. Why not? Why? I don't that's know. Not, that's if a valid like, art form. Yeah, but if I was going to like film it, maybe do it. You n- you never do no because I think it's, it. I think it, I think it could be beautiful. But when you but I think it's beautiful when it's we're going to in slow together. motion. We're going to invite some who are just going to dance around you, just dance around time. you the whole time. Yeah, oh. and just make me feel totally and absolutely <laughs> yeah. uncomfortable. Um, right. We could get some ribbons in here. Yeah, you totally right. could make it happen. Let's do that. Okay, great. All you right, can you, and you can dance if you want, Lauren. Not on video. <laughs> Why are you mad about the Oscars? Why okay, are you mad about. A let show me you preface watch? this. Let I didn't watch. <laughs> let me preface this with none of it matters. There's bigger things going on in the world. I'm an actor and a writer. I'm saying this openly. Like that. That is what I would. That is my dream is to reach there. And I openly admit it doesn't matter in the grand I, scheme of things. Can I say I agree with you? Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with you. You, yeah. know, what, you know what does matter? What? Lady it does Gun not Gus matter. Gloves. No, it doesn't matter. They, they were pre- they were pretty no they were pretty sick. I saw the video of that. I'm not gonna lie. Um, I didn't see all the nominees, so I of the best. I'm 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 referring to the best actor category. Um, I don't care. I'm sure you deserved it. I mean, people voted on it. It wasn't like it was one person. You know, but they campaign for that shit. And okay, I don't really blame them. It's for your career. I mean, like you but, know, but at the it's same no time different too, than what we're doing right now. How, how can you say you know? Before I got into film, before mm-hmm. like I was like, oh, that's my path. Yeah. I would. I was like, oh my god, this is amazing. This is incredible. This is fantastic. And then I got in a film, and I'm like, this is bullshit. But it is though. I still think it's, I'm not just. Dis- I'm not dissing the beautiful work and, that and, they've done. But, but the irony is, is like I'm like, this is bullshit. And they're like, you're nominated. And I'm like, no way. Oh my god, thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't understand how Michael Keaton didn't win the Oscar. I don't understand. I've I, I out of the of the nominees, and forgive me if I'm missing anyone else. I did see. I saw the Imitation Game. Benedict Cumberbatch. Uh, I did see the theory of everything with that Eddie Rainman. Red, Redmayne. Redmayne, excuse me. I for, forgive me. That's not, I should know it. Eddie Redmayne for the theory of everything, which was great. And I did see Michael Keaton and Birdman. And from a total objective standpoint, amongst those three, if Bradley Cooper won, 
I couldn't have made a judgment because I didn't see it. So that's not fair. I don't think. I don't think that's fine. I didn't see it, so I can't judge on that. Of the three that I did, which I thought were the top contenders anyway, I if you know if Bradley Cooper had won, okay, maybe if I saw American Sniper and then I could make a judgment. I don't understand how Michael Keaton didn't win. I saw those performances on a total objective level. He was so much better. In my objective opinion about something that doesn't matter and an opinion who doesn't matter, he was phenomenally more nuanced. And yes, people come back and say, well, of course he is. He's more experienced and older. It doesn't matter. You should win because you were the best. Meryl Streep continues to win those those things. And that's subjective as well, because those that group of people decided she was, of what, whenever she did win, the best that she won. But Connor, yes. Inaratu did win, and maybe Inaratu got those nuance, nuances out of Michael Keaton. That is true. Yeah, but that's not to, but at the same time, it's like, you know, look, if, okay, if, if the nominees for best actor. Mm-hmm were five people who performed his character in Birdman. Mm -hmm. Okay. But we're not. We're taking separate individual things, trying to judge them on a way where it's like, that makes sense. Okay, then that's... If you want to talk about but, I mean, like, and I readdress think, the whole system of it, that's totally fine. Yeah, and but, fair. but I mean, that's that's why it's totally like a goof and it's just a night for people to feel you know, better about themselves. Right. Yeah, and that's and totally even, fine. Even the viewer. That's totally fine. Yeah. And I, I totally accept that. But because it for for what it is within its own world and its own structure, a world I, a word I detest, I think he should have won. Not just my opinion. No, I thought he was great. My opinion. Did you think he was better than? But they're they're different. That's like saying that's like saying Connor, you're better than me, or I'm better than you. For the cap for, for the for the capability of for the for the. Uh, I guess the gauge on which they could have achieved their strongest characters. Michael Keaton went above and beyond. Eddie did a wonderful job. And I don't wish the. I mean, like, first of all, he's never going to hear this, so it's not like, you know, not until I'm, we tag him and Twitter him, and then the world just descends upon. I just, in, in my objective opinion, <laughs> would it be great if Eddie Redmayne came on here to be like, as an as, as 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 a fan? <laughs> that's not what he sounds like at all. As <laughs> as a fan, I love Benedict Cumberbatch. I love Sherlock. I've loved anything. I loved you know his role in Star Trek. If we still can't say who he was, um, we can't. <laughs> I, other, I don't know. Spoiler alert. He's con. Um, con. <laughs> um, uh, which he should have screamed. Um, no. Next but, time. <laughs> next. <laughs> for the third one. Yeah. Um, Star no. Trek three, the return of con or I, I mean, as an actor, as a fan, as an artist, I value him the most. And that's not to say, I mean, just because I liked the things that he's in and I, I, I appreciate his nuance. I feel for him in some ways. I know what it's like to take, really weird looking pictures. I know what it's like to have a really pale, fair, weird bone structure complexion. I know the pain of that. And I, he's, a, he is an icon and he's a figure for a community of pasty white men out everywhere. Of European <laughs> Benedict des- Cumberbatch. Of European descent everywhere. Yeah. He is smog. See, I, th- he, okay. And Dr. Wait, Strange. Are, are we, are we, yes, yes, he will be. Yes. Can't wait. Are you excited? So excited. Thrilled. Is this one of your, is this one of your like, it's one of casting my- things where you're like, this is a good idea. Big one. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, is, is it, is it that we like, like, I think Michael Keaton consider considering his body of work and everything that mm-hmm. he's done deserved it, but we're okay. looking at it from a performance standpoint. Right. And there's, you know, Scorsese was nominated like 12 times before he even friggin' won. And he won for a movie that he probably shouldn't have, he, he should have won for the 11 other movies before. Who were the other, just to make a fair assessment, who were the other male nominees? There was Michael Keaton, Benedict Cumberbatch, Benedict Cumberbatch, Eddie Redmayne. Eddie Redmayne. Um, was it David Oliello from Selma? From Selma, correct. And then I think that's it. No, there was like nine. There was nine best actors. Maybe I'm wrong about no, that. Best picture. Best about picture. Nine. There was a ton. There was. Was that all of them? I that's just only four. Through. There's usually five. Okay, let's I even use that. Let's even is. American Sniper. Oh, Bradley Cooper. So I Bradley said that. Cooper, yeah, Brad, yeah, American Sniper. Bradley Cooper. Hot political topic. Selma. Civil rights. The Imitation Game historical you know account and also gay rights um very the theory theory of everything very that wasn't the focus of it michael keaton birdman washed up white male actor trying to make sense of the world and i still think he should have won based on strictly performance but it is what it is there is there was there's no community 
supporting Michael Michael Keaton's Birdman. And this is coming from someone who I support. Well, not you know what I mean. I I, I endorse all the, the the statements and messages. Birdman didn't have a soapbox, and maybe that's why I liked it best. And I'm totally biased. And I lo- the imitation game nearly made me cry. It, I thought it was so well done, and I I, I felt. For the character, and I, I and I and I thought it was so beautiful, and I mean, and tragic, tragically beautiful at the same time. And Theory of Everything was lovely and was inspiring. Strictly based on performance, I liked Michael Keaton better. I, I think I agree with you. Now, obviously, from uh, from an actor and playwright standpoint, does that make you kind of analyze these a little bit more? Like, can you really watch a movie objectively when you're a part of that that world, or uh, you know, are, are you yeah. kind if of actor picking apart right. little things? What's that? If the actor does it right, yeah, yeah. If if everyone's doing their job right, I get. I Birdman got an audible like you, I was I was seeing my friend Joe Joe Connor. I was sitting next to him. I had an Joe. audible response the scene when he's coming out of a liquor store and it was a beautifully filmed with like those like lights chili and, pepper and there's the home there's a homeless man doing Macbeth's monologue you know you know struts upon the stage and then he turns to him and it's a throwback to an earlier line I'm giving full warning sorry if you didn't see it spoiler it's a beautiful scene no seriously spoiler skip over a couple little bit it doesn't mean anything to the plot it's just a beautiful moment he turns to him and out of nowhere just goes I'm just trying to give you a range man the, the nuance of that man's performance, Michael Keaton's reaction, the way it was filmed, the throwback to an earlier line by a different character, I literally went, oh. it was like breathtakingly poignant. And sometimes those things are a little, I mean, then the fact that the way it was, I mean, the true gem of that movie besides the performances and, you know, writing was first and foremost the way it was filmed. It was so beautiful and it was so, the way it was uh, seen. Well, that's, to- that's Chio. That's, that's, that's Emmanuel Lubezki. Was he the cinematographer? Yeah, he did. He did movies such as like Children of Men. Did he? He won, right? He oh was, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they won Best Picture, and it yes. won yeah. And the Imitation Game won Best ad- Adapted Screenplay. That now won the, Best now Original. There's, now there's a great. There's a great. Um, there's a podcast called. Um, oh Jesus Christ. Um, the, That's an interesting the, podcast. The Q and A with Jeff Goldsmith, who used to who used to who he used to be the editor in chief of. Uh, 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 creative Screenwriting Magazine. Right. So he, they do podcasts with like writers and stuff and he didn't get, um, uh, there was one with um, Inaratu and then there was one with Edward Norton and Michael Keaton mm-hmm. and they were talking about like Inaratu's process where, you know, I mean like there's this, there's, there's these three big directors from Mexico, which is um, Alfonso Cuaron, Del- Inaratu and Guillermo, um, del Toro. and Guillermo del Toro who and they're like they're the like three, three best friends the three amigos <laughs> the three amigos and you know um Emmanuel Lubezki does like Alfonso Cuarón movie he did, he was the cinematographer for Gravity okay um which I didn't say they, they, they there was a great story and so so uh, Emmanuel Lubezki's um the cinematographer's nickname is Chio so they all call him Chio I don't know what the hell that means <laughs> So Edward Norton and Michael Keaton were having this conversation about Inaratu's process and, 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 you know, Michael Keaton's like, you know, I do it one way and then, you know, Alfonso or, uh, uh, Inaratu comes over and, and says, you know, now do it like this totally different way. Mm-hmm. And he goes, he goes, then I do it this totally different way. And he goes, they're long takes. Right. He goes, so then he comes back and he goes, no, 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 go back to the other way. And he goes, then I do that. And then Inaratu comes back over and goes, no, 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 go back to the other way. Right. And he goes, I, you know, he goes, as an actor, like you start like, oh my God, am I doing something wrong? Am mm-hmm. I doing something? And he goes, he goes, Chio just leaned over to me. He goes, don't worry, man. He's just talking to himself. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like, you that's know a process, I mean? but but like that's like the the and the, the and the, the uh, dynamic and the, that these right. guys have, well, which is which and is the incredible. uncomfortableness that he was placing in his actors might have just been what he wanted. He might have just wanted them to be a little. Yeah, it, you know, it, it, I mean, it totally could be, but like, you know, that if you watch interviews with Emmanuel Lubezki, he's, so, he's fascinating. He's just like this guy Dude. who who totally understands right. light, camera movement, mm-hmm. everything. He's amazing. To jump back to Rich, I, as an actor and a playwright, if I can even call myself that, um, you can. I can, but I think we're talking about apples and Oscar winning oranges. Um, <laughs> uh, and well known oranges, and I'm talking from Scranton, PA. Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, the same way that, you know, have you, you know, whatever you, anyone's, I mean, do you read newspaper articles? I mean, if, if something's, you know, incorrectly done, then you switch on to that mode. If not, no, I think it's pretty much just, I definitely sit there and think, I want that part. 
I definitely sit there and think, I want to do that. Yeah, as a writer, it'll give me a better appreciation after I'm done. If I'm reading right. something and then I, I look back on it and go, okay, that was a good read because... Blah, 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 blah. Right. right. Then, so I'm assuming that movies would probably be similar. In Theater's sense. different, though. Right. When I, I can't sit through theater, I can still have a great time, and if I love it and it's beautiful, I'll engage in it. I will always have something to say, even if it's positive. Oh my God, that was so great because of this reason. But generally, I'll always have something I would have done differently. It's yeah, but so it's, subjective. But it's, but it's good that right. you have a reason. You know what I mean? Right. Where a lot of people are just like, I don't like that. Well, why don't you like that? Right. I don't know. The, why Why did you like that? The worst thing Here's in the why. world is an armchair critic uh, because 99% of the time they That's have most of nothing are. to add to the know? dialogue. Like, exactly. Right. Yeah. They just, I like it or I don't like it, but I can't give you any real criticism as to why. Yeah. I don't right. know. I don't know why. And, and, and you know what? You know, doing doing what I do, especially you know, since I got like you know Jimmy working on this movie and and Jared Tobin's actually coloring the movie right now, and then I have a I have a meeting in a little bit um, with the director who's amazing, um, uh, Kerry Patton, um, but he's he's amazing in a way where he's, um, it, it, it's very cool to work with. Like like I call myself, I've always called myself a blue collar filmmaker. I'm never the guy who's like. But the light needs to, and it's supposed to show the expression of, and you're performing, like, I don't, I don't know how to do that. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know how to get into somebody's head to get them where I want them to go. And it becomes very frustrating to me, which in turn becomes very frustrating to whomever I'm working with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Carrie's the kind of guy who's like, you know, he's like, just, you know, let's see what happens. You know, and then from there... You know, because the because the thing is, is like you 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 get good people to do the job, and then you really don't have to talk to them. So he, really, he's treating the project more like this living, breathing thing that's continuing to develop, as opposed to like say, you know, this is my vision; it has to be this way yeah, from he's beginning not, to yeah, end. Yeah, he's not walking in with a schematic for like what right. he wants it to be. Because some because some directors do that, which is fine, and that's and that's you know how some people work. Everybody's different. You're never going to work with the same person twice. You know. Um, Going back to you know directors, I don't know if anybody here appreciates David Fincher, mm -hmm. but I did post. Yeah, I just watched uh, Gone Girl. Uh, over it was the weekend. really good. It was great. Yeah. I posted. Um, there's like this 12 minute snippets of like this conversation that he had, and some and, and the and the moderator asked him a question like you know why do you do like 99 takes? Mm -hmm. And his his whole conversation and his whole thing was he's like all right we're at a set that took six weeks to build, right? It cost us millions of dollars to build it. And we're paying every creative professional, every actor, every grip, you know, me, the producer, like everybody's getting paid. And the goal is to get out as soon as possible. Right. You yeah. know what I mean? He's like, let's take him. the time and get it right. Sure. Good for him. You know, which gave me, you know, I always love David Fincher, everything he's ever done. But I, I the only thing I haven't seen is Benjamin Button. I, 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 it just really didn't interest me. Meh. I thought it Good. was a very nice movie. I, I I'll probably get to it. It just really didn't interest me. Like David Fincher, like just I I just love his work. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I'm the yeah. guy who's like I love David Fincher, and, right? And Michael Bay, right? <laughs> <laughs> For two completely different reasons. Because you know I was just listening to a, a, a conversation with Paul Thomas Anderson on uh, WTF with Mark Maron, mm -hmm. and Paul Thomas Anderson is like he's like I have those heady movies. At my house, he's like, but I also have Billy Madison. Right. I mean, everyone, right. No one is completely yeah. a genius. Yeah. Nobody's going to be like, I need to watch Network 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Right. Or even Birdman for that, because depending on your mood, like movies are your drug, man. Movies are your little escape. interesting trivia question to just a question or, or fact uh, question that I'll tell you the fact. Um, Cameron Diaz, she was in Gaines in New York, correct? correct. She was the, the female. That part was originally intended for blank. Uh, Julia Roberts? Nope. It's kind of a trick question. Scarlett Johansson? Meryl Streep. Really? Because oh. it took him years to get it made. That's how long it took him? Oh, geez. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. That's really... I, I And if I'm wrong, please correct me, because I've, I've seen that from numerous sources, but I've never like seen Martin Scorsese say it. Right. It just took him that long. Scorsese has a problem with making movies. Like it always takes a long time. Well, it's not like he wasn't it's either making like movies. I think it was no, like no, no, that no. Movie. But like that movie, like he's he's doing a movie right now that he's been trying to do for twenty five years. 
Well, yeah, there, a lot of those those big directors have those projects where it takes them a long time to get to that point. But a lot of yeah. times it, it works in its favor because, you know, it wasn't right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't the right time for like Gangs of New York. I don't know, like with the the great sets and the big budgets and things like that, maybe wouldn't have had that opportunity 20 years before, you know, to no, do it something probably of cost, that scale. Yeah. It probably would have cost a momentous amount of money just to because they'd have to build that. There's well, no yeah, such thing uh, as Yeah, like, a lot of it they filled in with extensions. CG, but they yeah. did it very tight. Tastefully. How old would Daniel Day Lewis well. have been? Back then? Yeah. When he tried to make Gangs of New York? Like whenever I, I don't know the exact year, but if you're if you're figuring Meryl Streep was the ingenue at the time. Yeah, right. And, so, I mean, and and I think Meryl Streep is gorgeous. I'm not dissing Meryl Streep. She's you know, at that time she wasn't Cameron Diaz anymore, but neither is Cameron Diaz. 